What is integrity? I don't even know how to spell that. I don't even know what it is. <laughs> it's one of the things on the street. You know what I'm saying? Okay. What is integrity? Integrity is being honest, being upstanding, genuine. You don't lie, you don't steal, you're an honest person. Doing what you're supposed to do. <laughs> what is integrity? I don't know. Yeah, it's it's inside you. It's inside you. It does the right thing. No idea. Privacy. Personal principles. Strong character. Uh, honesty. Doing the right thing all the time, no matter what the time is. Upstanding a person's uh, character. It's not always doing the popular thing. It's just doing what the right thing is regardless. Feeling good about what you do. Being ethical and moral. What is integrity? I don't know. Shout out to all my people. What are you doing, baby? Regular. KC, you know what I'm saying? Integrity. Strong morals. Integrity is honesty. Someone who stands up for what they say and follows through. The content of someone's character. You know? And how they do it. You might be asking my name, but it's all my name. I'm on TV. What is integrity? Good question. Integrity is your word, your honesty. Whether or not you can be believed for what you say. It's a good person. Point in the way is just be true to oneself and be true to other people. Being upright, honest, being a good citizen. That's what I think integrity is. Oh, integrity is a person that carries some of your character. Say what you mean, mean what you say. Tony Dungy, who's a football coach, for those who don't know, integrity 
the choice between what's convenient and what's right. Now, this you're going to have to look close at and, uh -huh. and, and, and let it figure in. If the government is asking you to call evil good and good evil, will you submit? If the government says 2 plus 2 is 5, but you know the answer is 4, what would your answer be? This is the first book of Daniel, chapter 1, verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he had carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put the treasure, uh, put in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. And then verse 5 the king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names to Daniel, the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Let's pray. Now, Lord, we pray that you take this familiar passage, help us to see something new from it today, something that we can use in our lives every day until your coming. In your name we ask. Amen. Now, we talked about Daniel about, no, let me see, it was uh, about March, and we talked about the handwriting on the wall. And so this is not a repeat of that. I looked at that this morning. This is all different, mostly different stuff. But the three Hebrew children and Daniel were taken away from, from the, uh, the city. Now, just in the time uh, of history, um, in Athens, they were starting construction on the Acropolis. In Mexico, the Mayan or Mayan uh, community was thriving. Aesop was writing his fables. Confucian and Buddha were lived and waxing philosophical. And Greek art truly began to excel. The Greeks introduced the olive tree to Italy. And the Phoenicians made the first known sea journey around Africa. So it was a time of a lot of things happening. Verse 5, the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies. Now, he was basically trying to bring them into his world. And it was, what he thought, quite an honor for them to be able to eat the same food that was at his table. But as we know, the Jews had very strict dietary laws. There were things they were not allowed to eat, and there were things that, if they did, especially meats, had to be prepared in a certain way. There were ceremonies that had to be done for the preparing of meat. And so by him bringing them to, to uh, eat at his table, they were, he was trying to make them a part of this new world. Uh, verse 7, to them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. They changed their names. Now Daniel means God is my judge. Belshazzar means Bel's prince, or you've heard of the god Baal, same person, Baal's prince. The name Hananiah, meaning beloved by the Lord, was changed to Shadrach, meaning illumined by the sun god, or given wisdom by the sun god. The name Mishael, meaning who is as God, was changed to Meshach, meaning who is like Venus, one of the gods 
of the Babylonians. And then finally, the name Azariah means the Lord is my help, was changed to Abednego, meaning servant of Nego, who was one of their gods. So he took them out of their culture that they were used to. He changed their diet that they were used to. <coughs> and then he gave them new names, naming them after false or heathen gods. And verse 5, the second half, says there was three years of training. They had to learn a whole new language. They had to learn a whole new culture. Now, one of the reasons that Nebuchadnezzar did this, it was a political thing, and that is since he went into Judah and took over Judah and, and, and ransacked the temple to show that his gods were superior, he also took their their favored young people, young people of nobility. And so the, the veiled threat was, I have your young people here in my palace, and if you have an uprising back there in Judah, guess who the first ones that are gonna get it? It would be your young people that I am holding. And so, uh, it, one of the things, the, one of the other things that Nebuchadnezzar was saying is, hey, I and my gods are powerful and we can take care of you from cradle to grave. You don't have to worry about anything else. Very similar to what we're hearing uh, down the beltway in D.C. I would think you have to agree that we are living in a world that has gone badly off the rails. Amazing. But we do not have to go in the direction that they're going. 1 John chapter 2 says, don't love the world and what it offers. Those who love the world don't have the Father's love in them. Verse 16, not everything that the world offers, physical gratification, greed, and extravagant lifestyles. Wow, do those three things sound like the USA today? Physical gratification, greed, and extravagant lifestyles. Those things don't come from the Father. It comes from the world. And the world and its evil desires are passing away, but the person who does what God wants live forever. So uh, John chap 1 John chapter 2 uh, addresses the three things that were problems in that society. Heathenism, materialism, and narcissism. Heathenism is the pursuit of pleasure. Pursuit of pleasure at all costs. All we think about is what's right in front of us today. I want to be happy today. Uh, there was an old song in the, the, the 60s, uh, 60s or 70s, if you can't be one with the one you love, then love the one you're with. And in the Woodstock, free sex generation, some of us uh, grew up on that. That is the pursuit of pleasure, heathenism. Materialism is the pursuit of possessions. USA. <laughs> I mean, if you watch TV, you've got to have it. You've got to have it. And if you don't have the money for it, there's a little piece of plastic in your wallet that'll help you get it. I mean, material possessions, you've got to have the newest car. You've got to have the biggest house. They, they are just hammering us all the time. And then narcissism is the pursuit of pride or position. He calls it the world, the flesh, and the devil. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. These things are not new. The pursuit of pleasure, the pursuit of possessions, the pursuit of position and pride are as old as ancient man. John is writing about how to live right in a world that has gone wrong. And that was in the New Testament times. He addresses three, the three things that people are pursuing today that the Bible prophesied they would in the last days. Paul said that in the last days, men would be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, and that they would love only themselves. Wow, ripped from the headlines. And 
uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 talks about godlessness in the last days. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of, their, of themselves, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, <coughs> abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable. Just as a side note, those that uh, you know, are asking for the uh, Confederate flag to be torn down because they are blaming that for the slaughter of those innocents at that church. Let me tell you something. They're doing away with the Dukes of Hazard. They're trying. We talked about last night how the, the one uh, council uh, commanded that Wycliffe's body be uh, dug up and his bones ground and burned by fire and then scattered around uh, because he dared translate the New Testament that people could read it. We talked about that, how crazy that sounds. Well, guess what? Civil War uh, monuments all over this country now, they are actually discussing tearing down the monuments and digging up the bones and putting those people somewhere else. Unappeasable. Slanders, without self-control, <coughs> brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into households and ca capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at the knowledge of of the truth. If you see a man on the street interview with some of the college people today, it is absolutely frightening that people are going to into great debt to have no common sense. In the end times, people will be consumed in trying to look out for number one. Also in these passages, Paul and John write to address these issues and will tell us how to live in a world that is obsessed with pleasure, with possessions, with position, you and I can go against the flow. It is possible. We can go against the tide. We can swim upstream. We can bring glory to God. And in spite of all that is about us, we can live lives that are transformed by Jesus Christ. You know, something as simple as the materialism of our day, and we've, we've had financial peace, we'll have it again in the fall, um, but learning that you don't need to have that new thing right this minute, you don't need to do that, and that, you know, Dave Ramsey talks about the, the amount of money people spend to sit in a car to impress someone, that they're gonna see at a red light for maybe 20 seconds, maybe a minute at the most, and then never see them again. But they're throwing a lot of their future down a rat hole just to be able to do that. <clears throat> Living for Jesus in Babylon requires three things. And this morning, the three things we wanna talk about are purpose, prayer, let me get there, purpose, prayer, and prophecy. First of all, purpose. Lifestyle. There was a lifestyle in Babylon that Nebuchadnezzar was trying to draw these teenagers into. Remember, these teenagers were probably uh, 14, 15 years old. And another thing that's important to notice, it was not a temporary thing. Daniel was still living in Babylonian captivity well into his 80s. So he had to learn to live a righteous life in a wicked, wicked time. Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Why? Because it had been offered to God. It was ceremonially unpure. It had not been processed according to the Old Testament law that he lived by. And he purposed in his heart 
that he would not defile himself. And we don't have time to go in all of the details. Uh, you read it before, how they asked for a vegetarian diet and to drink water to see if they could pass the test. And he went through those things. He tried to come up with something that the powers that be could live with, but that he could live with and practice his faith. The second thing are actions. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth 6 cubits. Now that is 90 feet high and 9 feet wide. As tall as a 9 story building. And here's what he said. He said when the, when the band begins to play, hail to the chief Whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a fiery, burning furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the people heard the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So there's a picture of it that Nebuchadnezzar's golden image was 90 feet high by 9 feet wide. That's a 10 to 1 ratio. That'll be important in a minute. You might recognize this place. This place has several interesting similarities. At the ground level, each side of this monument measures 55.5 feet long, which is equal to, wait for it, 600 66 inches. If you don't recognize that uh, number, contact your deacon. The height of the, uh, the, of the uh, tower is 555.5 feet, which is equal to 6,666 inches. That's a 10 to 1 ratio. The exact same type of dimensions that Nebuchadnezzar's golden image in Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. Now, many of the symbols that we learned last week, like the Statue of Liberty and the Washington Monument, they take their roots back to the goddesses and the gods of Babylon, the gods of sex. Here's a symbol that is a little bit closer to home. Anyone recognize that? And what is Mount Vernon mostly known for these days? It is the hotbed of homosexual activity in the city of Baltimore. Not m more than just about a mile from the Lexington Market, which has been called the number one heroin capital of North America by National Geographic. You be the judge, all of what that means. Let's return to our story. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you're ready, when you hear the sound of the music, when the band begins to play again, oh, and you decide to bow, all well and good. But if you do not worship my image and you do not worship my god, you shall be immediately cast into that furnace. You see, in this day and age, it's not good enough that you don't agree with someone. I, I was happy to see the quote there from uh, Duck Dynasty that, you know, because you don't agree with someone doesn't mean you hate them. It means you don't agree with them. But in this day and age, not only must you agree with them, you have to leave your beliefs and claim their beliefs as your own. They are starting to say that me wearing a wedding ring and being a heterosexual is hating someone else. Wait a minute. How did we get there? We got there because these people will not be satisfied. I was happy to see. Just an aside, it's not even in my notes. This is free, I won't charge you more. Uh, Mississippi is passing laws bringing prayer back into school. The governor out in Kansas is saying, I'm passing an executive order that says churches and, and, and conscientious objectors will not be subject to the new law 
that the uh, Supreme Court just passed. And I meant that the way I said it. The Supreme Court just made law. That is not what they're supposed to do. Amen. Congress is supposed to make law. Congress is supposed to make law because if we don't like the laws they make, we vote them out. The Supreme Court is an appointment for life. They're supposed to say, is this a law that abides with our Constitution? But in the last few weeks, we have seen the White House make law, and we have seen the Supreme Court make law. Here's the problem. Where are the rails? Where does it stop? Our system is a system of checks and balances, and we don't have any checks and balances anymore. And if someone, if someone in, in uh, D.C. decides to make a golden image and say, you're all going to uh, worship that, let me tell you something. With the precedent we have right now from the Supreme Court, they can do it. You say, that's crazy talk. Yeah, well, maybe it is. All right. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. We're not going to be careful about this. We don't have to go and have a prayer meeting. We don't have to ask our mama what to do. We don't have to go and consult with the teacher or with the preacher. We're not careful. We have no need to worry to talk about this. Verse 17, if you're going to throw us into that furnace, if this is so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us. Now, that's an important statement. They believe that their God can deliver them. But here is the more important statement than even that first one. Verse 18, if not, okay, our God has the power to deliver us. We believe that. But if he decides not to, we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. They would not bow. They would not bend. And as, we, as you read the story, play catch up if you need to, they were thrown into the fiery furnace. They would not burn. They were fireproof. All right, quickly here. As Christians, we are commanded to pray. But these three did not stop to pray. Why? They knew the difference between right and wrong. So they weren't afraid. They stood up. They stood up to the most powerful leader in the then known world, three teenagers, and they said, we will not worship your gods. Then in chapter 3, verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered King Nebuchadnezzar, your threat means nothing to us. If you throw us in the fire, the God we serve can rescue us from your roaring furnace. And anything else you might cook up, oh king, this is out of the message. But even if he doesn't, it wouldn't make a bit of difference. We still wouldn't serve your gods or worship the golden statue you set up. Previously in chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar threatened to destroy all the wise men. Remember, he had a dream, and then he couldn't remember the dream. And then the wise men came and said, well, tell us the dream, and then we'll tell you what it means. And, no, 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 you guys have pulled that stuff before. You're so smart, tell me the dream, and then tell me what it means. And he said, no one's ever asked this before. This is crazy. And he said, yeah, well, guess what? And, and, and uh, he threatened them. And when Daniel heard about this, he said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let me pray about it. Let me and my friends pray about it. And they prayed. And then they got the message. And he was able to give it. And that's one of the reasons why this, this golden thing came up. Later there was a law that the king signed that said you must only pray to Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went to his house, and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem. Here's another way of looking at it. Daniel knelt down and praised and praised his God that day just like 
he always did. He was under a death threat for praying to his God. So what did he do? Hide in his closet? He opened his windows toward Jerusalem three times a day like he did every other day. Daniel's faithfulness to God landed him in the lion's den, where his detractors were sure he would be devoured. But God sent an angel that shut the lion's mouth. Now, you've been watching the new TV series, Zoo. This is especially creepy. But uh, anyway, the, the, the uh, angel was there to protect Daniel. All right, moving quickly. Prophecy. God saw the faithfulness of Daniel and his three friends and gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. To Daniel, God also gave the understanding of visions and dreams. Now, I don't believe that you and I are going to have visions and dreams today. I believe we have the entire canon of Scripture. But I believe the Lord gives us information. He gives us urging. He taps us on the shoulder and says, talk to that people, or he brings people into our, our lives that we can help. But one thing, uh, talking about uh, prophecy, oh, goody. I had a page out of line there. Uh, Daniel, uh, let me see where we are here. So you, son of man, here's, here's out of Ezekiel. You, son of man, I have made you a watchman over the people of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. That is how you and I prophesy today. Well, how do we get a word of warning? We read our Bibles. We pray. We pay attention to God when he's talking to us. Paul said, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Today, there are many who claim to be Christ followers, but are not. When they're asked, they'll check the Christian box on their form. They live a generally moral life, but in reality, their faith is nothing more than a cultural accommodation. As our society and culture becomes increasingly hostile toward Christianity, and trust me, you're going to see more and more that being called a Christian will put you on the receiving end of hostility. There are spiritual qualities that become more and more important. There are three in particular that we can't survive without. Living for Jesus in Babylon requires purpose, prayer, and prophecy. Let's all stand together, bow our heads in a word of prayer. Lord, we believe we're living in the end times, or at least we're living in difficult times, just as Daniel faced wicked people, unbelievably crazy religions, oppressing times, Lord, we are facing many of those things. We pray that we'll have the courage of Daniel and his friends, that we will stand up, that we will pray, that we will maintain our Christian testimony, and that we will prophesy, we will tell people the good news of salvation. Be with us now in the remainder of the service. In your name we ask. Amen. Let's remain standing. Step you come.